What's up, everybody? Happy Friday. Welcome into the Friday edition of the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. No major news or notes as I'm recording this, so I figure it's Friday. Maybe we'll do something a little bit more fun. I figured in the light of the crazy stock market situation with what GameStop and everything going on and whatever, uh, you know, Bitcoin or, you know, currency that you want to currently invest in, I figured I'd have some fun and maybe go over a Packers stock report. So today I'm going to give you five Packers that I am buying, five that I am selling, five that I am holding, and then I'll give you five penny stocks as well. So we'll kind of go through this rather quick. I don't think I'm going to take too much of your time today, uh, but let's start with five players that I am buying. I want it to invest in these players because I I still think they are going to get much better than they even are at this point in their careers. So these are obviously going to be younger players for the most part. That's where you're investing in is stocks that you think have the opportunity to grow and uh, raise the most. So obviously younger rookies and second year players are the ones that are going to make up the majority of this list. And I'm going to start number one on my list with AJ Dillon. And I was just putting together my article for Friday. So today, as you're listening to this and I was looking at which players graded best on a per play basis over the course of the last year. So first of all, before I get to that, make sure to check out today's article. This is literally everything that I've worked on all season long, every player graded on every play, 18 games, a ridiculous amount of snaps, way too much time. I put together everything in one big document, best player, worst player, biggest regression, biggest improvement, best you know rated players per play, et cetera, et cetera. It's all in there and it's free. Check it out on PackerReport.com today. So that'll launch at 9 a.m. on Friday. But the the big thing, one of the big things that stood out to me was on a per play basis, A.J. Dillon was actually running back number one. Uh, Aaron Jones was two and Jamal Williams was three. And I quick took a look at Pro Football Focus to see how they had it. Their grades were actually A.J. Dillon one, Jamal Williams two, and Aaron Jones three. So really, really interesting. So that's their overall grades. Mine were on the, the per play basis. Jones graded out for me by far the best of the three based on how many snaps he got and things like that. But A.J. Dillon was so good that not only did he rank number one on a per play basis amongst running backs, the only two players on offense that he ended up grading behind were Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. Now, this is a massively, massively, massively small sample size, like less than 200 snaps. I think less than 150 snaps. So take this with some grain of salt, right? This cannot be used as a predictor of future success entirely, but in a very small sample size, in 150, uh, less than 150 carries right around there, uh, A.J. Dillon showed out very well to the point where for all players on the Packers with at least 100 snaps, he was the third best one on the team. So again, very small sample size. He's going to have to improve as a pass catcher, as a pass protector. But if you go back to, you know, obviously what he did against the Titans and then also in the playoff games, you can see him catching balls out of the backfield. He made that nice move against Tampa Bay, I think picked up 12 yards, you know, carrying a, a defensive lineman for an additional five yards using his legs. You know, we saw the agility that he had against the Titans. We saw him with a, a nice pass protection. I forget it was one of the two playoff games, uh, but you know he had that too. So I love everything that he has shown us so far. He's not a finished product, but if you're looking for a second year player that has the opportunity to break out in a major way, especially when you consider both Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones could potentially be gone this upcoming off season, give me all that stock in AJ Dillon. Number two on my list is Rashawn Gary. And no two ways about it. Rashawn Gary became more explosive and just a all out better player as the season went on. I love the stuff that he put on tape later in the year. You can see things slowing down. You can see it clicking for him. And I am really excited to see what he's able to do, taking it to the next level. As I mentioned, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that Preston Smith is gone, that Zadarius Smith and Rashawn Gary are your starters at edge rusher. You're going to see more snaps from Gary. He's going to get more opportunity. He's probably going to get bigger, more physical, which is crazy, you know, just with a full off season. So I am getting all the stock that I can in Rashawn Gary. I am a full believer in what he's going to be able to bring to the table. He has to show it over the course of the season, but really liking what, uh, you know, the, the progression and where his career seems to be headed. Number three is MVS, and I know 
I, I should know better. This is like the relationship that you can't get out of and they're, you know, you know that you need to break up and get out of it, but like you just keep going back because it, you know, the, the highs are so incredibly high. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't been a huge like MVS guy his first two seasons. I liked a lot of what he did this season, obviously with the caveat that there were some major missed opportunities and the fumble against Indianapolis and so on and so forth. But the games that he played well, he played really, really well. And his ability to stretch the field and be a deep threat on the outside just gives something that Green Bay doesn't have on this team right now. And I, I, th I do really think that he's starting to gain confidence. And I know there's still going to be some mistakes along the way, but I, I really think that he has an opportunity still to take another step, even in another positive direction. We'll take this as a believe it when we see it, but I still think the stock is low enough on MVS that I am buying and think that it can get higher than it is today. Uh, Chris Barnes, I just think that what he was able to put on tape later in the season, he looked like a legit starting inside linebacker that can play on all three downs. Uh, you know, I don't know that he's ever going to be a Pro Bowl level, level player, but I think he can be a solid contributor and starter at inside linebacker. It'll be interesting to see how Green Bay addresses that position this offseason, but I think they found a really nice diamond in the rough in Chris Barnes. And then number five is Jordan Love. And I, I still have some trepidation and hesitation on Jordan Love and, you know, when he gets in and things like that. But I don't know that uh, a lot of people have a ton of faith in Jordan Love right now. So you always want to buy, um, you know, stock when it's low and has the opportunity to still go up really high. The ceiling's the, you know, the sky's the limit, the ceiling's the limit, whatever lame cliche you want to put in for, for Jordan Love. You know, he, he could become a top 10 quarterback in this league. You know, the expectations of that, who knows, but I still think the stock is low enough that I'm still willing to buy on Jordan Love. Some players that I'm holding on, I've got stock in them already. I'm not willing to sell. I'm not necessarily looking to buy more, but I feel confident with what I've got. I'm going to go with Alan Lazard. I think with Alan, you just get what you get. He's going to be a good blocker. He's going to be, he's going to do all the little things. He's going to do the grunt work. He's going to be one of those support type players. And you need those guys on your team. I don't know that we'll ever get a game like he had against New Orleans ever again out of Alan Lazard. And I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. If you can get your, you know, four catches, 58 to 60 yards, um, maybe a touchdown here or there, move the chains three or four times and, uh, you know, dig out some safeties and corners and, and maybe even linebackers or defensive linemen for from, defensive lineman from time to time. I'll take that from Alan Lazard all day long. John Runyon Jr. liked what I saw. Still a long ways to go to become a finished product and a, a polished offensive lineman, but I thought what he put on tape was impressive considering he was a sixth round pick out of Michigan. Kingsley Kiki, I think a little bit of a disappointing year if we're being honest. I actually had a lower grade on him in 2020 than I did in 2019, which I don't think anyone would have really expected going into this season. Another player who showed some flashes against New Orleans and then kind of, you know, uh, you know, just didn't put up that same level of performance the remainder of the season. So uh, I want to see more from Kingsley Kiki. I think he still has more to bring to the table. Not willing to sell yet, but uh, certainly not willing to buy more at this point either. And then uh, two kind of just flyers, Jonathan Garvin and Vernon Scott. I really like both players. And I think what they show in regards to potential is much better than the seventh round value that Green Bay got them at. Look for Vernon Scott to have an opportunity to take over in that Raven Green role if they don't bring Raven Green back. And I think Jonathan Garvin uh, is going to move into a position where he legitimately gets playing time. Remember, Preston Smith probably gone. You've got Z Gary and then a lot of question marks. Garvin found himself on the outside looking in, was basically inactive, I want to say like the last eight to 10 weeks of the season, but I still saw some potential there when he was actually in the game earlier in the season that I still like. Um, and so I'm going to hold on my stock on Jonathan Garvin. Five players that I'm selling, and I'm not going the guys that are likely obvious cuts, save for maybe one at the bottom of this list, but Jace Sternberger. I've been a believer in Jace and I know tight ends take longer to develop, just some of the rumblings that I'm hearing and some of the things that uh, I've heard about Sternberger, I'm not, I'm not, uh, not only am I not buying, not only am I not holding, I'm ready to sell. And I just think Robert Tunyon, it, you know, took that spot. And honestly, I think Josiah DeGuara, Dominique Daphne, even those type of players made the jump. And I mean, look at it this way. Dominique Daphne was getting significant playing time at the end of the season when Sternberger was healthy and Sternberger was a healthy scratch. I think that tells you all you need to know. Um, I'm selling Sternberger at this point. Same thing with Josh Jackson. 
you know, one of my lowest graded players on a per play basis this past year, you know, couldn't get active on game days. And I know part of that was special teams, but if, you know, what are you doing right? You haven't played outside corner well, you haven't played inside corner well, they tried you at safety, they tried you on special teams and it didn't work at anything. So a lot of potential and it unfortunately looks like that's going to go unrecognized. I hope, I'm hoping I'm wrong on a couple of these guys. Number three might be an early sell, but man, Kamal Martin, just some of the stuff he put on tape late in the year, it was literally chicken with his head cut off stuff. And I love players playing fast and physical and aggressive, but this was way too fast, way too aggressive. And it looked like he was literally blindfolded at times. Like it was, it was bad. So uh, there's some potential there. I loved him in training camp. He made, you know, flash plays in training camp. So maybe selling on him is a bit early at this point, but some of the stuff again he had on tape late in the season is it was scary and I know again you know rookie fifth round pick these players take time to develop but Chris Barnes was well ahead of him at the end of the year and then uh, Oren Burks another one it's just he hasn't made it at outside linebacker hasn't made it at inside linebacker hasn't made it at special teams kind of the same situation with Josh Jackson and after a really amazing pick with Jair Alexander not only getting him but picking up an extra first round pick in the process the two next picks of Josh Jackson and Oren Burks, and then really Jamon Moore after that, Jamon Moore, like three back-to-back-to-back just nightmare picks in that draft for Brian Gutekunst, at least at this point. And then another player, same draft, my last one I'm selling here, J.K. Scott, just too inconsistent. You don't know what you're going to get, and there's more bad than good. You know, uh, the hang time was an issue. The, you know, directional kicking was an issue. What does J.K. Scott do well at this point? He's not kicking it far. He's not kicking it accurate. He's not, um, you, you know, going, you know, kicking it to a sideline specifically. He's not pinning them deep. He's not getting that, you know, bounce back play. There's, there's nothing that he's doing well. He, you know, he's he holds okay, I guess, on extra points and field goals but you're not keeping a punter around for that. So I am selling on J.K. Scott. Uh, what, three players from that same draft class and Josh Jackson, Oren Burks, and J.K. Scott. And right, then how about some penny stocks? Some guys that maybe don't get uh, talked about very often, but something just tells me maybe there's something with uh, a couple of these players. I'm not gonna go into them in too much detail, but Henry Black, Dominique Daphne, Willington Prevalon, Patrick Taylor, and Isaac, uh, Isaac Nada are the five that I'm going on. Henry Black got a cup of coffee, forced to fumble. Uh, really liked some of the stuff that he was doing on special teams as well as on defense when he got an opportunity. He's got a ways to go, but some potential there. Dominique Daphne, I really like what he put on tape, uh, especially when he got the opportunities in the playoff games. He ran a couple really pretty routes that Aaron Rodgers just didn't see him on the, on the play. He can dig people out. It certainly was better than John Lovett, and it'll be interesting to see how they use him alongside Josiah DeGuara, assuming both make the, well, DeGuara will make the team, but assuming Daphne makes the team, it'll be interesting to see how they use those two players. Wellington Prevalon, um, interesting defensive tackle that stood out to me in training camp as an undrafted free agent. Patrick Taylor didn't play a snap, barely got to, I don't know if he did practice or either barely practiced, um, but uh you know, interesting player out of Memphis, actually got more uh, carries at, at Memphis, if I remember correctly. Well, almost everyone at Memphis got more carries than um, uh, Gibson, who went to Washington and had a phenomenal season uh, this past year. So uh, Antonio Gibson, that is. So uh, I think uh, Patrick Taylor is an interesting player to keep an eye on, especially again with that running back depth chart um, being a little bit thin if, if uh, Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams end up leaving. And then Isaac Nauta actually played the last couple seasons in Detroit, actually got some snaps. He is your Mercedes Lewis replacement if Mercedes Lewis leaves potentially and Nauta can improve as a blocker. Um, he is more that blocking inline tight end. Green Bay doesn't have that player on the roster. And if all of a sudden Mercedes Lewis retires, those are players that sometimes can be hard to find. Would not shock me one bit is if Isaac Nauta made it in that role. They'd probably have to decrease it because he probably wouldn't do it as well as Lewis, but uh, would probably be the next best thing that's currently on this roster. So my buys, AJ Dillon, Rashawn Gary, MVS, Chris Barnes, and Jordan Love. My holds, Alan Lazard, John Runyon, Kingsley Kiki, Vernon Scott, and Jonathan Garvin. Um, my cells, Jay Sternberger, Josh Jackson, Kamal Martin, Oren Burks, and J.K. Scott. And my penny stocks, Henry Black, Dominique Daphne, Willington Prevalon, Patrick Taylor, and Isaac Nauta. That's going to do it for me. Make sure to check out Andrew and Kyle on today's audio version of the Packaday podcast. Make sure to subscribe here if you have not already. But until next time, and as always, go Paco.